can tame a God. Oh, powerful. Oh, powerful. We pull down heaven with shouts of praise a God. Oh, powerful. Oh, powerful. We are like thunder. Nothing can tame a God. Oh, Zion Church, it's so good to sing God's praise, so good to lift up our hearts in gratitude to our great God. We're going to go to the Word of God, we're going to share in the Lord's Supper. If you'd like to join us in the Lord's Supper, if you could get some bread and some juice, or if you don't have juice, water, and we're going to pray. We're going to pour out our hearts to our God. We're going to begin with that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. So let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Father, we give you thanks. Lord God, you have been so very good to us. We can't even begin to, to number blessings that you have poured out upon us all the days of our lives. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord God, giving us strength, giving us wisdom, giving us courage. We thank you for your word, Lord God, that we would know the truth. We thank you above all else for our Lord, our Savior, Jesus, that he gave himself on that cross for us all, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, the light of the world. Father, we thank you. We pray this day for all those on our hearts. We lift our families, our loved ones. We lift before you the poor and the needy, the broken in all this world, Lord God. We lift our nation to you. We ask, Father, that you would lead our nation in paths of righteousness. Lord God, we ask that as we live our lives, Lord God, we would be so filled with your Holy Spirit that we would bring your love, that we would bring the good news of Jesus to a very needy, broken world all around us. Father, speak to us now as we go to your word. We thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, we're continuing with a series of messages, How Jesus Did It, How Jesus Lived Such an Amazing 
life here on this earth, how he did the Father's will so well. He did the Father's will perfectly. How did he do that? And of course, you would say, well, he was God. Yes, he was God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Father sent the Son, Jesus, to this world. But when Jesus came to this earth, the Scripture says that he left the power and the majesty and the wisdom of being God in heaven. He obeyed the Father, filled with the Spirit of God. He obeyed the Father, lived this amazing, stunning life. How did he do it? What we're going to look at this week is why Jesus wasn't cynical. In a world as messed up as this world is, it's so easy to become a cynical person, an angry, frustrated, disillusioned person, uh, uh, somebody who's suspicious of just about everyone. Someone who has disappointments and projects those past disappointments on all the world. You know, Jesus had a whole lot of disappointments. Jesus saw the corruption and the hypocrisy of this world very clear, clearly, but he didn't become cynical. If Jesus had become cynical, if Jesus had become critical of everyone all the time, if he had become disillusioned, if he didn't trust people at all, ever... He would have never accomplished the will of our Heavenly Father. But he didn't become cynical, and we're going to ask him, as we look to the Word today, we're going to ask Jesus to teach us how to not be cynical. If you and I become cynical, if we see all the, the corruption of this world, if we see the, the selfishness of those all around us, if we become cynical, then we won't accomplish the will of God. We won't be the people that he sent us here to be. We won't live our lives well. So we're going to begin in the Gospel of Luke. It's chapter 4 at verse 38. And we're going to begin just kind of looking at this amazing life that Jesus did live. And right at the start, listen to this, verse 38. This is, you know, at age 30 is when he began then to do the things the Father sent him here to do. So he, he gathered a group of disciples, followers around him. One of those was a man named Simon, who Jesus would later give a new name, Peter, Simon Peter. So it says, he arose, Jesus arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose. See, in those days, if you had just a fever, there was no aspirin. There was no medication. A fever was life-threatening. But Jesus came and spoke to that fever, and it left her. And she rose and began to serve them. Now, when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. There was no medical care. Sickness was, was bad. No medical care at all. And the word goes out immediately. When this man prays, people get healed. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. People filled with unclean spirits, demons. In other words, just destroying their lives in all kinds of ways. And Jesus prayed, Jesus spoke to those unclean spirits, and people were well. Look over at chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. Jesus was, now what they called cities, we'd call real small towns. But while he was in one of the, the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. If you had leprosy, this skin disease, and really they defined the word leprosy much more broadly than we do. If you were, had this leprosy, this skin disease, you were a complete and utter outcast. Everyone considered you cursed. Everyone stayed far away from you. You were kicked out of town. The only time you could come into town was to buy food. And when you did, you had to have your finger over your lip, crying leper, leper, as you walked through the streets of the town and everyone scattered. But when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. He begs Jesus for it. Nobody helped a man with leprosy. But when he saw Jesus, he begged him. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. When Jesus touched that man with leprosy, the, the people around must have almost fallen over. You never touch someone with leprosy. You stayed away from them. The curse on them might come on you. But Jesus reached out. His hand touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Wow. 
about. This is, is what was happening, this depth of compassion, this depth of love, this, this power, this faith in prayer. Jesus was just doing amazing things right from the start. Look in the Gospel of John, chapter 2, at verse 23. Now he goes down to the big city of Jerusalem. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs, that means the miracles, that he was doing. But now look at these words. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. And let's lift this up first, that Jesus didn't become cynical because he knew what a sinful world this is. In other words, it wasn't like Jesus thought that everyone would just respond wonderfully to him. I mean, here he has crowds of people in Jerusalem like, whoa, this guy is awesome, this guy is awesome. But Jesus knew how sinful we all are. He knew these same people a few years, a couple years later would be saying, crucify, crucify. He didn't become cynical because from the start, he knew how sinful we all, we all are. In other words, if we head out into life thinking that things are just going to get better and better and that most people will, you know, do good things and great things and da-da-da-da-da-da-da, eventually we'll just get disappointed and disappointed and disappointed and then we'll seek into a cynicism. But if we know up front, if we know from the start, no, we're all sinners. We've all been diseased by this thing called sin, and sin just means rebellion against God. We're all a mess. If we know that up front, then we can avoid the cynicism that makes us angry and frustrated and skeptical and, and disillusioned. If we know up front, no, we're all, we're all a mess. In Matthew chapter 10 at verse 16, listen to something that Jesus said. He said this to his, his followers, his disciples, that he was sending out to go and pray with people and tell people the good news. He says, behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. There will be a lot of people who will do you wrong. But listen to what he says next. So be wise as servants. Know that up front. Know that up front. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Don't become that angry, critical, cynical person. Yet be wise as serpents. Know how sinful we all are. And be innocent as doves. Keep your heart tender, as the scripture says. Keep your heart filled with love, as God has commanded us. Do not become cynical, knowing up front, yes, you will be let down. People will do you wrong. This is a sinful world. We're all sinners. Know that up front. Look in Matthew chapter 22 at verse 15. Then the Pharisees went. So the Pharisees, you remember, were uh, religious leaders, kind of like preachers, but this Pharisee movement in Israel had become very hypocritical. It had become corrupt. So then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him. They became very jealous of Jesus because they saw Jesus praying and miracles happened, because they saw the power with which he spoke and people hanging on every word that Jesus spoke. So the Pharisees became very, very jealous of Jesus. So they plotted how to entangle him in his words. They had already made up their mind. They were going to get rid of this Jesus one way or the other. And they sent their disciples to him. So some of the disciples of the Pharisees, the Pharisees now send them to Jesus uh, along with the Herodians. Those were uh, some of the followers of King Herod saying, now listen, so they send the, the Pharisees, send these people to Jesus saying, teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully and that you do not care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances. They're flattering Jesus. They're going to try to trick him in his words. They're going to try to get him to say something that they can accuse him of and that the crowds won't, won't like. So they're flattering him, flattering him. And then they get down to it. They say, tell us what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So Israel, you remember, had been conquered by Rome, Caesar, the Roman emperor. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Rome or not? If Jesus says, no, it's not lawful, then the Pharisees will run off to the Roman governor and say, look, he's teaching revolution. If he says, yes, we must pay our, our taxes, then they'll, they'll, they'll say to the crowds, you look, look, he's, he's with the enemy, he's with the Romans. So they think they've nailed him, right? 
But Jesus, aware of their malice, he wasn't going to get sucked in by their flattery, thinking they'd come asking an innocent question. But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? The word hypocrites is, means actors. He said, you guys are acting. He says, you're acting. Why are you, why are you putting me to the test? And what did he go on? He said, bring me a coin. And they said, whose picture's on this coin? They said, Caesar's. Then he said, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. So what do we see in here? We're seeing Jesus isn't cynical. He's not cynical. He's not saying, I can't believe these guys, these idiots. Why, why do I even bother to try? All they do is just try to, you know, test me, get me caught in my words. He didn't become cynical, just furious with them all. He knew up front. We're all sinners. You know, as people look at politics, people become incredibly cynical about politics. Politicians are sinners. We're all sinners. We're all sinners. You know that up front. You know, you have a friend who does you some terrible wrong. You thought this person was your friend. That person's a sinner. We're all sinners up front. Jesus was able to keep a tender heart he was able to be filled with mercy, with love, with kindness, despite all this corruption, all this hypocrisy, all this wickedness coming against him. Because he knew that's the way it is. It's just the way it is. Look in Matthew chapter 7 at verse 3. Jesus says, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? So he's speaking to those who have become cynical, critical, frustrated, angry. He says, you see a little speck in your brother's eye. You see something wrong in, in that person, that person, in those people, in those people, right? But you don't notice there's a huge log in your own eye. You're not looking at your own sinfulness. So we can avoid becoming cynical if we will remember, if we will remember what God's word tells us. We are all sinners, each and every one of us. You know, in the book of Romans, it tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All, all have sinned. All right, let's go back to Luke now, chapter 5, down at verse 27, and we'll see a, a second reason why Jesus didn't become cynical. It says, after this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi. That's a fellow Israelite. But if he was a tax collector, that means he was working for the Romans, who had conquered Israel and was treating Israel terrible. And it means that Levi, whose other name was Matthew, was working for the Romans because he could get rich by being a traitor to his own people. So Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving every and Matthew, Levi, he's like, what? And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. Everyone hated Levi. Everyone did. But Jesus looks into Levi, into Matthew's heart, and says, follow me. At verse 29, and Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. These are people that everyone else despised. Everyone else despised them, hated them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, at Jesus' disciples, saying, Why do you eat with drink and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Why are you hanging out with people like that? Why is your teacher, Jesus, hanging out with people like that? We're not supposed to have anything to do with people like that. We hate them. And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Wow. Now let's think about Jesus there, right? He is reaching out to people who are a mess, people who have become traitors to their own people, but people who also inside know the, the, the evil that they have done and they know how hated they are by everyone. Jesus is doing an awesome thing. And here are these Pharisees and these scribes, you know, grumbling, complaining about him in all their hypocrisy and their, their jealousy of him. What do we see here? That Jesus didn't become cynical because he made up his mind to keep on loving people no matter what. 
So we fall, so first of all, he didn't become cynical because he knew from the start, and he always remembered that we are all sinners through and through. And then secondly, he made up his mind that he would keep loving all people no matter what. No matter the hypocrisy of those who are criticizing him for loving people like Levi, Jesus made up his mind he would keep loving everyone no matter what. See, we have a great calling on our life. What does the scripture say over and over and over and over? The greatest of these is love. Above all else, hold unfailingly your love for one another. Right? That's the great calling on our life, to love as God has loved. But if we become cynical, if we become critical of everybody, frustrated, angry, disillusioned, projecting past disappointments on everybody all around us, then we'll just sink into all that frustration and we'll lose sight, we'll lose sight. You know, the people that you're criticizing are the people you're supposed to be loving. The people that you're pointing out all their failings and shortcomings are the people you're supposed to be praying for. Jesus didn't become cynical because he held on to the number one calling on all of our lives, to love no matter what. Look in Luke chapter 6 here at verse 6. On another Sabbath, he entered, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there with, whose right hand was withered. Maybe this man had had a, a work accident and without, you know, setting, maybe there's some broken bones, they weren't set properly. Uh, maybe he had some muscle disease, we don't know. But in a labor-driven society, there, there weren't any, hardly any, quote, white-collar jobs. Uh, somebody with a withered hand was in a lot of trouble, heading for or already in abject poverty. So the scribes and the Pharisees watched him, watched Jesus, to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath. It was the Sabbath day. Now, on the Sabbath day, what? We are commanded to do no work. So they're going to see if they can accuse him of doing the work of healing this man on the Sabbath day. So that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he, Jesus, knew their thoughts. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come and stand here. Now, can you imagine in the synagogue? right in the synagogue as they're worshiping God. Here's this man with a withered hand. Jesus is getting ready to pray for him, to bring healing to this man's life, to change this man's life. And here's these grumpy, old, cynical, frustrated scribes and Pharisees ready to accuse Jesus of doing something wrong. Isn't that just the moment you're like, I'm out of here. I'm done with this. What a bunch of hypocrites. I'm done. But Jesus didn't walk out in disgust. He didn't see all the hypocrites and say, what's the point of me even doing anything? He saw a man who needed help, a man who needed someone to love him enough to pray for him and help him. And so Jesus said to the man, come and stand here. And he rose, the man stood, rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, to the scribes, the Pharisees, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? Nobody answers. And he, after looking around at them all, he said to him, said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. Oh, Jesus chose to love all people no matter what. Didn't matter if the room was filled with hypocrites. Here's a man who needed to be loved. And Jesus chose to love. Look at verse 11. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Yep, Jesus didn't lose sight on the one task that we all have. Yes, of course, there's corruption. Yes, of course, there's political hypocrisy. Yes, but there are hungry people all around us who need to be fed. There are broken people all around us who need to be loved. There are ignored and forgotten people all around us who need someone to pay attention to them. Yes, you have loved ones in your own family who need you to stop being so critical and frustrated and grumpy all the time, who need you to start loving them. Jesus chose to love. He gives us the strength. He gives us the strength to love no matter what. He fills us with his Holy Spirit, right? So that we can love no matter what. We get frustrated in church, right? We, here's, here's Jesus, quote, in church, in the synagogue. We get frustrated in church. It's not what we thought it would be. It's, oh, there's so much hypocrisy in church. You know, you know what I tell people when they say church is just filled with hypocrites? I say, well, there's room for one more. Come on. Okay, right? Our task, yes, we're all sinners. We're all a mess. But our task is to love one another. Set aside all of our criticisms, 
What does the scripture say? Bear with the weak. Yeah, okay, so you look around and you see people who are so weak in their faith. What does the scripture tell you to do? What, walk out in disgust and say this is a bunch of hypocrites? No, you're to love those people. Wow. So look over in Luke now chapter 6 at verse 22. Listen to what Jesus had to say about this kind of love. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. You have enemies, maybe they're political enemies, whatever. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. There are people who hate you. Well, here Jesus said, the calling on your life, what you have been put here to do is to do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Bless them. Don't go on a rant on Facebook about people who curse out Christians. Pray for them. Bless them. Love them. Bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To what? Look at this. Jesus ratchets it up now. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. People are, we are all like claiming our rights, our rights, our rights. Here's Jesus saying, love, love, love. Give to everyone who begs from you. People say, I am not, I'm, people get too cynical to even give anymore. They say, yeah, people just waste this money. Here's Jesus saying, give to everyone who begs from you. And from everyone who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Because you're a mess too. And people could give up on you. People could have walked out on you a long time ago. God, maybe people did walk out on you. Well, then God could have walked out on you too, but he didn't. Jesus didn't stop loving you. You don't stop loving Yep, you're frustrated. Get rid of that frustration. Let go of it. It's, it's worthless. Cynicism. This, this kind of, you know, the cynic thinks that everyone else is too stupid to see what I see. I see all the hypocrisy and the corruption. I see the conspiracies and other people don't because they're too foolish. They're too naive. Drop all that and start loving people. Just start loving people. Wow, at verse 32, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend, if you give to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good. And lend, give, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons, you'll be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the, uh, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. God is kind to the ungrateful. God is kind to the evil. He said, are you going to do less when he's been so good to you? And what does Jesus say then? Be merciful even as your father is merciful. So he didn't become cynical because he knew up front that we're all sinners. It's a sinful world. He didn't become cynical because he chose to love all people no matter what. And now let's look in John chapter 13 at verse 1. Now we're going to the last night of Jesus' life on this earth before he dies on that cross the next day. It's the time of the Passover, the biggest of the Jewish holidays. Jesus has spent three years with his disciples, Andrew, Peter, John, Matthew. Yeah, Matthew, that Matthew, right? <laughs> Who had been a traitor, became a disciple of Jesus, one of his closest followers. Jesus spends the evening with them sharing the Passover feast, the holiday meal. Look at verse 1 there. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world. I can't even read this passage without crying. He's been with these guys for three years now. But he knows that one of them is going to betray him. One of them is going to hand him over to his enemies. In other words, Judas Iscariot is going to go and tell Jesus' enemies where they can find Jesus alone because there was always crowds of people and Jesus' enemies were afraid to arrest him with crowds around. But one, Jesus knows that Judas is going to go and tell them where they can find Jesus alone so that they can arrest him. And Jesus knows that the rest of his disciples, John and Peter and all the ones, the ones who were the closest, John and Peter, the closest to him, they're all going to take off and run and hide be cowards. They won't stay by his side. But listen to this. When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, 
having loved his own who were in the world. He knew all their shortcomings, all their failings, but he had loved them. And remember, Peter kept saying the wrong thing all the time. But Jesus kept loving him and loving him and loving him. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He, loved, he chose to love and love and love to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing, now listen to this, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that the Father had put all things into Jesus' hands, and that he had come from God, knowing that he had come from God, that the Father had sent him here to this earth, and was going back to God, and that beyond the cross, beyond the horror, his death on the cross, his descending into hell on a cross the next day, beyond that, he would be returning to the Father. So knowing, knowing he had come from God and he was going back to God, he rose from supper, he suddenly, he stood up, he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist, and then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. They didn't have shoes. They may at most had real flimsy sandals. The streets were horribly filthy. There was no modern sewage. They were horribly filthy. Jesus gets the basin in the water that was usually by the front door. Somebody's supposed to wash people's feet. Nobody had washed each other's feet. Jesus put, ties a towel around his waist, poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around. Jesus didn't become cynical even that night when his best friends were going to abandon him, when one of them was going to betray him. He didn't become cynical that night. Why? Because he knew the end of the story. He knew what was beyond their betrayal and abandonment. He knew what was beyond the horror of the cross, all the hypocrisy that was going to take him to that cross and all the wickedness that was going to just come on him on that cross. Jesus knew what was beyond all of that. He knew the end of the story. He knew he would be with the Father again. He knew that all the glory, the goodness, the love, the joy, the peace of heaven would surround him again. And he knew, and he knew that his act of selfless love, of going to that cross, would capture heart after heart after heart after heart, would bring the mercy and the love of God to heart after heart after heart after heart, would save, rescue you and me. And so he didn't become cynical even that night, but instead knelt down and washed their stinky, smelly feet. Wow. Wow. Do you know the end of the story? Do you know the end of the story? Do you know that day is coming when he will wipe away every tear? Do you know that not one ounce of love that you show to this broken world is ever wasted? Because God, right? God takes all the love. God takes every seed of love, the, the seeds of, of the good news of Jesus that we plant in hearts. God doesn't allow any of it to be wasted. If you know the end of the story, then you don't sink into this anger, frustration, becoming this critical, grumpy person all the time because you know that God works all things together for good for his people. Mount Zion Church, this world needs you and me to be people who, 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 who are wise as serpents, innocent as doves. We know it's a sinful world. We choose to love no matter what, and we know the end the story. Woo, I wish I could hear you say amen. I'm going to say amen to myself. Amen, Pastor Craig. <laughs> On that same night that he was betrayed, he took the bread. He gave thanks. He broke it. He gave it to them, saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup. He gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of this. For this is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Lord God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he didn't just throw his hands up in disgust and forget about us all. But he went to that cross. He loved us enough to go to that cross. 
And so, Father, we pray. We pray, Lord God, that you would fill us with faith. We come to you humbly, confessing our sin, trusting in the love, the mercy of God. Amen. If you have faith in Jesus, take this bread. You know, if you're a person who doesn't have faith, but the Lord's talking to you right now, you can put your faith in Jesus. You can turn to him. Put your faith in Jesus right now. Take this bread and eat. Feed on the love of Jesus. If you have faith in Jesus, do you have faith? You can put your faith in him. If you have faith in Jesus, drink this cup. Drink deeply the love of Jesus. What a great God we have. What an incredible, awesome God we have. Hey, if you would like prayer, get in touch with me. Call the office of the church. Reach out to me on Facebook. Send me a text. Send me an email. Whatever it is, I'd be glad to pray with you anytime. I'd be glad to pray with you anytime. Hey, do you know we're worshiping outside every Sunday night at 630? in front of the office adjacent to the sanctuary. It's a beautiful time. It's nicely shaded there. It's not too hot. Hope you can come and join us. We're going to sing one more song here. After we sing, we have a special video uh, I want you to see. God bless you, Mount Zion. See you soon.
It's Steve Presser, the worship director here at Mount Zion. I'm really happy that you decided to join us today. I'm giving you a sneak peek into both worship tents today, our worship tent and our youth tent. Um, this facility has turned into basically an operations center, a ministry operations center. If you have uh, helped out or participated at all with our food distribution program throughout the week, go to our notes tab here on the online platform and you can uh, get the details as to when drop-off as well as delivery takes place. But just look around in this building at how much food is here. Each week, anywhere between 200 to 300 families are coming here to fill up on groceries and get their necessities that they need for the week. And the ministry here is just absolutely incredible. I'm sure that Brian Malcolm could always use a handful of additional volunteers but the Lord has really blessed Mount Zion and the Lord is blessing our community because of the efforts that go into this food program. So that's what's happening in the youth tent. I'm gonna walk you across the hall to the worship tent where a lot of additional uh, changes are taking place. So even here, there's a staging area for more food that you can see just for the food distribution that takes place. Speaking of food, on Monday nights, don't forget, we have our food trucks that come outside. Proceeds of everything that uh, gets sold, a little bit of that gets thrown to uh, Children of Zion Village to help them out as well. So don't forget about the food trucks who are here. There's usually about two to three trucks each week. And you can follow them on Facebook at Mount Zion Food Truck Mondays uh, to see who's coming next. So now we're finally back inside the worship tent. A uh, little messy at the moment, but that's because we have so much taking place. One of the big things you'll notice when you first walk in now, we got a brand new screen that's on the rear part of the uh, worship tent, and that's to allow our vocalists and our pastors, our other teachers, uh, children who are singing, to allow them to see lyrics, words, and other types of things. And um, over here to our my left, your right, this is where all the magic happens, right? So... We just got done tonight recording our music that you just uh, worshiped to. And now tomorrow afternoon, Pastor Craig will be sitting right in front of that green screen. He'll be preaching a message for all of us to hear. In fact, it's going to be the one that you're going to hear or just heard. So um, I'm happy that we got to give you a little bit of behind the scenes. Hopefully in a few weeks time, we're going to be making use of some of these new cameras that you see popping in around. And um, we're going to be live streaming some services and just continuing to expand how we bring the gospel message to each of you. Mm -hmm. 